and I'm a part of the new church, if you could, if I could use it in that term. Um, and again, the older church, this celebration was carried on a little different, yeah, if I could yeah, just be honest. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was just carried on a little bit different than we do now. Um, I was with a group of uh, my friends, young ministers, and we were talking about the difference in now and then. Um, and when you look at most of those that came before us, they had a different mindset about Christ. Mm -hmm. They had a different mindset about church as a whole. Um, every day of their life, they lived it as if this might be the day that he will crack the sky and come back. And so with that being said, I've got to walk right. I've got to talk right. I can't afford to slip up. I've got to dress right. Everything that I say could be judged. It could be held against me. And Lord forbid, if he cracked the sky, and now I'm not ready. And so, I, again, I'm not saying that this generation, my generation, there are not those that have that same mindset. But again, they responded differently about this week, about not only this week, but the name of Jesus. And we hear it all the time. We hear the older saints say, you can't say the name of Jesus back then because the church will go crazy. It was the truth. Don't start talking about God coming back at the benediction. We're going to be here another hour. The church going to go crazy. We ain't, gonna, we, cause we ain't worried about school. We ain't worried about the, the test tomorrow. Not worried about any of that because they believe that if you was in the house of the Lord, the Lord would give you strength to pass the test. That's just the mindset that they have. And so, again, when I, when I begin to look at this occasion, it brought back to remembrance the older church. And I thought, are we really celebrating like we should? It's a good thing that we, uh, we are under a pastor who preaches and teaches the gospel. And we're not strangers to uh, a Jesus' uh, death, burial, and resurrection message. We're not strangers to that because our pastor preaches that year round. Uh, and so even with that being said, we still have a different response. Uh, and so again, as I begin to look at this, go with me really quick. Jeremiah 13, uh, the Lord let me hear. Uh, Jeremiah 13 and verse 11. Grab that with me really quick. I just want to show you something here. God was talking about his people, Israel. Jeremiah 13 and 11. Hallelujah. When you have it, please shout amen. I got it. All right, let's read, let's read that right there, verse 11. For as the girdle cleaveth to the loins of a man, so have I caused to cleave unto me the whole house of Israel and the whole house of Judah, said the Lord, that they might be unto me for her people and for her name and for her praise and for her glory, but they would not hear me. Amen. And so what, 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 what God was saying here was that we were created to cleave to him as a belt around one's waist. That's what we were created to do. And one thing that I've, I've, I've found out is that when you cleave to God, then you begin to have a closer and a more intimate relationship with him. Uh, when I read this, it made me think about my relationship with my wife. Uh, when I first met my wife, I, I liked her. Once I talked to her, I said, oh, she's, she's a pretty nice young lady. I liked her, uh, and then uh, it went a little further. I, I said, well, I like her. I said, I think I might love her now. And so once I began to love her, once I began to love her, I started to want to be around her. I started to want to uh, uh, be pleasing to her. I started wanting to uh, uh, make her happy. And uh, then we fell in love. I did. I don't know what she did. She better love me. Um, but then we fell in love, and so now I'm to now we were to the place where I can't be without her. Now I, I I've got to have 
her around in my being. And so it is the same with God. I think sometimes we don't really understand the totality of this week because sometimes we're not as close to God as we need to be. And so when we're close to God, then we have a desire to want to know him more. When we're close to God, we have a desire to want to be pleasing to him. And everything that we do, we want it to be pleasing to God. And so I thought about that and I said, well, if we want to be pleasing to God, we've got to have that relationship. That's why the older church, when you said the name, something happened. Because they had a relationship, they had a different type of experience with God that sometimes we have yet to experience. And so when you said the name Jesus, something happened. Say the name Jesus now, we sit and we say hallelujah. But you said the name Jesus back then. And I believe today that it still can happen. Because it still has the same power and it still has the same authority. And so it made me think about that. And so uh, 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 before I could get into uh, this account, it, it re I really wanted to kind of uh, make some sense of uh, why we are where we are and, and the appreciation um, that uh, we should have toward this. The thing that came to my mind is um, that um, there's got to be more. We've got to do more. It's the, it, it came to my mind as I was studying, and I wrote it down. Uh, uh, this can't be it. It's got to be more. We are selling ourselves short yeah. uh, with, uh, with, with our full capabilities of having this relationship with God. But I'm going to move on because um, I want to get through here. I don't have a lot of time. Uh, and so uh, we see uh, we are... Uh, here with Jesus before Pilate. And you've heard throughout the week how we went from the garden to uh, the, the chief priest, the high priest, Ananias and Caiaphas. We see those things. And now we see where he is before Pilate. Um, this is um, very interesting because when you look at Barabbas, there's not a lot that you can find about Barabbas. There is, there is little of nothing that you can find except the meaning of his name. And so um, when I begin to look at this, I, I begin to rub my head. Um, and you know, I'm, I'm kind of like Deacon Gardner. I'm not as deep in, you know, as he. But when I read, I, I try to dig and pull from, from the uh, text. Um, and so here you have it before. Uh, Pontius Pilate. He has um, been wrongly accused. He has been um, called a blasphemer. He has been uh, assaulted. And he has done nothing wrong. At this point, we know now from two uh, key individuals that he had done nothing wrong. He had no guilt. He was blameless. And at this point, they had no charges worthy enough to sentence him to death. So now we're at the point to where they're still insisting that he be crucified. And from the beginning, we see that Pilate did not have that in mind for Jesus. We see that because he sent him to Herod and tried to get him get it off of his hands. He said, well, if this man is a Galilean, then send him to Herod. Herod couldn't find anything, so he sends him back. And so we're still here. We still have this crazy mob that's in an uproar that is demanding that we crucify Jesus, the king of the Jews. Crucify him. So we get to the place where now, uh, I, I was looking at this, and one of the things that just blows my mind when you read this is um, he doesn't defend himself. He doesn't defend himself. I see uh, uh, <laughs> uh, we get it, we didn't got some stuff that's smaller than this, and we immediately go into defense. It wasn't me. I didn't say that. You lying. But here we have Jesus 
who says nothing, not one mumbling word, got this crazy mob, crucify him. I can, can you imagine this mob, thousands, hundreds of people gathered, demanded, crucify Sister Norman, crucify her. Crucify Sister Smith. Kill her. Crucify her. If you stand there, you don't say anything. And so we see this. And so Pilate says, you know what? I can't find any fault in him. What I will do is I'll chastise him. Then I'm letting him go. Because you haven't given me any evidence that is worthy of me killing this man. And so let's look briefly at Isaiah, the 53rd chapter. Let's jump over here. Isaiah 53, I believe it's 5 or 7. Thank you, Jesus. Isaiah 53. Thank you, Jesus. Let's look at this. Let's look at this prophet Isaiah. Let's look at this. Years, hundreds of years prior. Isn't it amazing how detailed this is? Yes. This is just amazing. Let's take a look at this. Isaiah 53 and 5. Let's read it all together. But he was wounded for our transgressions. I'm not going to kill him, but I'll chastise him. So we have to go back to Isaiah and get a glimpse of what the chastisement was for. Because we can't talk about Barabbas in the exchange without talking about the chastisement prior to. So let's look at this. So he was wounded. This wounded here. Uh, is talking about a bodily, a bodily wound, uh, not only a mental wound, not was only mentally he was wounded, but his physical body was wounded. When we look at bruised, uh, we understand that this means the crushing inward and outward. The four is the part that really jumped at me. For the cause of which he suffered was not of his own. For, for me, for you. For you. The chastisement had to be, had to be, if we were going to ever be back in relationship with God, something or somebody had to be chastised. Now I'm not talking about a chastisement from a mother and a son or a parental relationship, but I'm talking about for someone who has guilty of committing a sin. So he was chastised. Upon him. It was as a burden. He carried it. The sin. He took the sin and he carried it. He was on his way to the cross. So here we have 
have this man, the man, Jesus Christ, the Lord God himself. So there's nothing wrong. You can't find anything in him that is not of God. We can't say that for ourselves. Squeaky clean. Couldn't find it with one of those little brushes that Brother Rob cleaned the cars with. If anybody has ever had a car cleaned by Deacon Doremus, he got these really fine brushes that get down in some of the places that you would never imagine. Couldn't find nothing with even with one of those. Stripes. The stripes. The stripes. The stripes. Prophetically had to be scourged. It had to happen, Dr. Little. Isaiah is already uh, uh, years and years prior. He said this. He said this in the word, so it, it had to happen. It had to happen. And guess what? It should have been us. Had to happen. So here comes Jesus. Pilate says that we're not going, I'm not going to kill this man. But chastise him. Don't kill him. But chastise him. And then we have healed. This is the aspect where we are spiritually. Spiritually brought back into relationship. Upon completion on the cross. Uh, this is the, 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 the thing that has to come to mind when you think about the name of Jesus. This is what has to come to mind. This is the backbone. This is the motive behind Christianity uh, and, and the new covenant all in itself right here. There ought not be one time that somebody mentions the name of Jesus and you don't get on your feet. The name of Jesus. Oh, glory to your name. Sacrifice had to be made. Had to be a sacrifice. He's God who said it and his word doesn't change. It had to happen. Had to happen. So he's chastised. We can talk about the chastisement and, the, and, and, and what we could imagine that it looked like. I hear that uh, one of the utensils that they used to chastise him with was a whip that had the stripes on it, that had the, 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 uh, the uh, objects toward the end, such as uh, uh, bones, that as they hit him and pulled it away, his skin came off of his body. You mean to tell me you can't honor that? We can't, we, we, we can't at least say thank you. And, and that should be something that, that's not uh, 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 stirred up by anyone else. But that's just for me. You ever gave somebody something and said, you know what, this is for me. This is just for me. This is just for me. It's just just cause. Just cause of, just cause you who you are, this is for you. And, 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 and so, uh, let me move on here. So he's chastised and bruised. So here he comes back out. Comes back before the people. He, he, he's been scourged. It's unrecognizable. Can't look at him. Could you imagine that? Could you imagine that? In the movie, The Crack, The, uh, the Passion of the Christ, uh, the, the man gave him the signal after they beat him so bad on one side, he did like this. Flip him over and get the other side. For you and for me. I don't know about you, Dina Batron, but. But he didn't say a mumbling word. And he took every strike. Didn't say a mumbling word. He didn't defend himself. He didn't call the angels to come and rescue him. But he stood there. And he took every lick. 
He stood there and he understood when he prayed in the garden what his assignment was and he stood there. I believe when he was praying in the garden, when he asked the Lord to take my cup, believe that the Lord gave him the strength to just stand there. Stood there.
said, Dr. Little, this is my story. This is my story. 